Yet another coronavirus update for the real estate industry today with uh, industry local industry expert Stephen Kitnick today on the WBNL podcast. It's still National Park Week, so let me ask you, how much do you know about the national parks? Find out today on Pondering Zen. Welcome to Wandering But Not Lost, your online source for finding balance so that you can align, connect, and prosper. I'm living right here and now and I don't want to miss out. Is this what life's all about? The world is calling and I'm listening. Yeah, I'm listening. And now your hosts, Jen O'Brien and Matt Emerson. You've reached the WBNL Wandering But Not Lost podcast, where real estate and reality meet. This is episode 116. You can find all of our show notes over at WBNLpodcast.com. Jen O'Brien. What's the what's the latest? What are we talking about today? Could it be something COVID related? Huh. Maybe, hmm. maybe not. Okay. Uh, yeah, we got to continue just to sort of uh, help everybody along with what's happening. Here, here's what I know: businesses out there, it's about uh, making a decision. You know, making a decision whether you're going to work or not. People are out there. It's not as many sales across the country as um, as there were because we were going. We were really trending to go into a really hot here base anyway. A really amazing record breaking, perhaps year. And maybe we'll yeah. get back to that. But there's definitely business happening. And so today, uh, Steve Kitnick, who we've had on the podcast before, we do a little interview with him. Uh, he's he has made an adjustment and is teaching all of his classes online. He was an early adopter. He's a, he's an early adopter in a lot of things. So we have a nice little conversation that we're going to have with Steve regarding um, what he's seen. And he's been around a couple days. Uh, licensed in California and here and so yet again he's made an adjustment to his business and he's going to offer some of his advice on on uh, a few things that are impacting the Vegas industry that's, awesome. that's what we're going to do uh, parks though I've been I've been seeing a lot of people talking about parks I saw our ranger this morning on it on the show talking about virtual taking v- virtual trips around the park so that's pretty cool we're still in National Park Week there, and I'm, there have been so many awesome live streams from the park, which they always do, but not with this frequency. Like this morning, I was watching this really awesome uh, live stream from Zion, mm-hmm. which um, uh, we featured earlier in the week. Or yeah, was that, or was that yesterday? I'm, I'm getting no. It was that was Redwoods yesterday. Anyway, um, and it was no one talking. It was just the sunrise, and it was the most beautiful thing. Nice. The birds chirping and the sun rising over the valley. It was really, really cool. So, uh, I, it's been fun to to just watch uh, live feeds from across the country at the national parks all week long. So that's been kind of cool. Today, we're going to test your uh, national park knowledge, trivia, and mm-hmm. uh, kind of fun facts. We're going to go into that. But before we get into all of that, I need to talk about probably the well, right at this very moment, it's the top of mind for me, and I know it probably is for a lot of people when it comes to this whole shelter in place and the COVID-19 thing. Um, what the hell are we going to start doing with our hair? Because what the hell is this? <laughs> I always have something like this going on because this is what my hair does, and your hair does what it does, but it's uh-huh. getting very, very long, and I, it's hard to control. In a couple weeks, man bun. Oh, my God. Listen, how about, how about the, the corona bun? Uh, what, what, I thought, can't Laura help there and cut your hair a little bit, trim it up? No, I'm doing an experiment. No skill. I want to see what happens. I've always wanted to grow my hair out. So here we go. Okay. Well, your hair grows pretty, pretty, pretty well. Mine too. But I will tell you, I am ready for some of those things. It's amazing. I've never had my nails so long, hair, right? I'm ready. And I don't really go to do a lot of manicures, pedicures, but that's one of the first things I'm going to go do when it's safe to do that again. Uh, so I got to I got to throw kudos out to you. You have been just killing it on your Instagram stories and all your posts with the National Park. I've been enjoying that. You've been having hey, fun with that. I told you last week that I was never an Instagram storyer, so I've been into it this this week. And it's been I'm telling you, when you don't really do any research beforehand, and you're doing that. It's fun to see what you don't know. Like you know all those little stickers they have on there. Yeah. You know? Well, of course, because you do this. I see your stuff all the time. <laughs> So the first couple of days I'm putting it in there and I'm adding the stickers. I'm all proud of myself. I didn't realize you could make the stickers bigger until about Wednesday. Oh, you did a little pitch thing. 
So there was and you one... can turn them and you yeah. can move them. Well, I, I could tell the turning, but I didn't get the make it a bigger thing. And there was one I really liked. It was a, a camera that said, you know, take only pictures, leave only footprints. And I thought yeah, that was yeah. really cool, but I couldn't read it. And I'm like, well, what the heck is this sticker? You can't even read it. And I was playing around with it and finally it went whoop and it got big. I'm like, aha. Uh -huh. And then you learn that there's, you can just limit. You can only put like maybe two stickers or something on there. There's all these little, there's all these little Instagram story rules. So the trial and error of the Instagram. A story. Well, here's scary. the question: Are you are you going to keep that up even after the national? Park no, well, not away? like this. You know, it's funny because what I've been doing is more than you normally do. I mean, I've been doing a little video intro every day and all that, and then posting all these pictures. And I won't do all of that, but I'm going to continue to do them because they are kind of fun. And plus, I think really do people because people go there first. I do when I go there. I look at see, you know, there's certain people that I follow. I'm like, ah, so you know, what are, what are they doing today? Here's the question: How many days in quarantine are we? I'm well, you always use, you use the seventeenth as your the date because that's uh, when Vegas went so down. What is so. That? so what are we? We're so at... today's the twenty what? Tell me that because I'm gonna post it here in our Four. our little uh, coronavirus so widget for Be Live TV because I think it's great. Oh, I don't it's know. Still that's, normal. That's, Jen, that's math. Well, <laughs> come on, seventeen <laughs> plus another. How many? Oh four. my God, we're gonna have to cut this. Thirty. Out. How many gonna, days? How seventeen. Many days? 30 days, best of three, and all the rest of 31 is like 31 minus uh -huh. 17 equals 14 plus 26 equals 40. There you go. I had 40 up there, but I think that's wrong. But I'm going to go with it. We're going to say it's 40 days. I, I, oh, it's no, it's 38. Enough. It's 38. It's 40 on Sunday. But 40 is good. 40 is for California. 40. We're splitting, the, we're splitting the difference. 40 days it is, 40 days and 40 nights. And all right, let's 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 go talk to uh, Mr. Steve Kitnick and see what uh, what he has to say. And then we'll talk some more. I'm interested in seeing if I know any of your park trivia. Awesome. Okay. You're listening to the Wandering But Not Lost podcast, where real estate and reality meet. Join us and subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Google Play, and now on YouTube. All right, welcome to episode 116 of the Wandering But Not Lost podcast. This is the real estate segment, and today I get to have a conversation with a, a frequent, you've not been a frequent, but in the very beginning when we started, we had you on the podcast a couple times, Steve Kitnick, so it's been a while, so I'm happy to have you back on. I wanted to do a little conversation with Steve Diamond, Diamond in the Desert, actually. Maybe we should talk a little bit about that in a second, Steve. Uh, because Steve has a very interesting background where he did radio and things before, and I'm very happy to say he's an early adapter to understanding how to use live stream and Zoom, and we'll get him to talk about that as well. Steve and I have known each other for, good Lord, 20, at least 20, 20 years. years. Uh, we met uh, November of 1999 when I first... Wow. I, I came to Las Vegas uh, July 1st, uh, 1999, having been a real estate broker, which I still am in California, from uh, 1986, uh, April. This is my anniversary month, uh, 34, wow. 34 wow. years. Wonderful. And I uh, came here in 99 and uh, signed on with you uh, with Prudential Americana at the time. So it was so here, November 99. So here we go. And we've followed each other through the years. And yes, our relationship what? has lasted uh, longer than any of my marriages. Okay, very good. I'd love to know that. And honestly, Steve, we have seen, so let's jump into talking about, I know you, like me, had uh, a bit of a flashback to the short sale market when all this started happening, because you and I talked about it, and I'm like, hmm, and I'm feeling, Steve, we have to dust that off, because there's, I believe with, in Vegas, I don't know if it'll be everywhere, you know, we have a, a different situation. This is not a housing crisis that we're in, right? However, comma, if we continue with people not having jobs and they have not as much equity, not everybody has the same amount of equity. We have a lot of people who purchase homes and once everything recovered and they're in good equity position, but not the people who bought a house a couple last couple of years, right? If the market shifts and goes down and people are out of work and they get behind in their payments, we could get ourselves back into maybe not a 75% uh, of the businesses distressed properties, but it could be 20, 25%. What are your thoughts on that? It well, it could certainly, it's certainly possible, uh, mm -hmm. you know, we, we don't really know, <laughs> you know, That's we, the problem. we, we don't we'd know, be right? in a different business, but uh, I think we have to prepare for it. I, I'm not an economist, uh, uh, you know, my background is in other areas, but my gut instinct says that if we did have 
a, a real major housing issue. Uh, the next bailout is going to help the homeowners uh, and, and not the banks as they did in the past. So I think it might be a totally different bailout with a lot of forbearances, uh, which are already starting, uh, deferred payments, which is putting money on the back end of loans. Mm -hmm. So I think I want to be prepared uh, just as I what became prepared for doing live stream uh, video conferencing, continuing education classes. Right. I, I had a feeling that it would probably be coming. I wasn't going to wait for the real estate division to approve it. I wanted to be ready to go. And uh, you helped me with that. And uh, we're doing it. I And I beat everybody to the market by a minimum of two weeks. So and, I got to be ready. And so we, we will be ready. And you and I will join forces as we always do to take a look at that. Because I think you are 100% right on uh, this time around, if, if homeowners start getting into that distressed place, things hopefully will look different and we'll be looking out. So, but the real estate agent could still have a major role in that. Cause remember when we did this, Steve and I created a course called, uh, CFAC, sort of, right? Sir, well, we had two of them. Uh, the first one we launched in uh, May of 2009. Uh, although we were training even before that, that was, uh, the certified short sale professional where we got licensed uh, to turn uh, an already existing online course into a Nevadaized uh, version and continuing education. And then later uh, the certified foreclosure alternative consultant. Uh, and so, yeah, we trained a lot of people uh, in this town. To and that approach of why we called it foreclosure alternatives is what's sticking in my mind, Steve, that to your point about forbearances and maybe loan mods and things like that, we're just going to have to stay up on it, right? The, the point for everybody listening would be pay attention to what's happening, what banks are doing, what the government might be doing if people start getting into, if, if the uh, unemployment issue continues on and people don't all give, be able to get back to work. Because let's face it, uh, companies are going to use this as an opportunity to restructure and get profitable again. So are they going to bring everybody back? Who knows? These are all the things I'm thinking about every every week and day to, to kind of say, how do we stay a little bit of ahead, ahead of what's happening and be ready to adapt and adjust to the market? So we have to be that, that consultant that goes out and says, let me help you. Let me get you in the right direction. Let me be the source of the source so that if later they need to sell their house, we're here for you. That was the approach that we put together in yeah. our in our course, right? Yes, and I think that uh, there's a couple of aspects of our course that are very applicable right now, and that is, uh, for example, uh, homeowners are very uh, we're anxious and uncertain. I think we might, uh, real estate agents could uh, reach out to their existing clients to uh, see how they're doing, mm -hmm. uh, make a contact, and uh, might even apply uh you know, that Kuvler-Ross model of the five stages of grief uh, Absolutely. You know, with regards to uh, there's probably a lot of angry people out there. Absolutely. And uh, maybe some people are going into uh, uh, some form of depression. Uh, you know, we're not therapists, but, we, you know, our our approach and what I was always proud of and remain proud of uh, that we are we're consultants and uh you know, we're empathetic. Uh, we're more than just, uh, you know, selling widgets out there. This mm -hmm. is important stuff. And and so I think we it, it's an opportunity to reach out, uh, make mm -hmm. phone calls, Zoom, whatever they want to do, and reach out to people and see how they're doing. And, uh, you know, because I think when you help people in times of distress, uh, mm -hmm. they, they really uh, feel really good about what you're doing for them. Uh, more so than maybe just in regular normal circumstances, so uh, I think everybody should be uh, contacting their uh, their clients. Absolutely, and just do a check in. I mean, honestly, not about business, because inevitably, when you have, we actually wrote a script, Steve, to for our folks that of uh, uh, if they get, if I was to call you, you were on my list, and I'm like, hey, Steve, it's Jan. It's been a while. I haven't had a chance to check in. How are you doing during all this? How's the family? And we're going to get into a dialogue, right? inevitably major uh, many many times steve knows i'm in the business i sold him his house he's going to get around to jen how's your business how's the market what's happening with the real estate market it gives you an opportunity to have a conversation about that but not to start with that right right so and then but just checking in with people is is, is critical people appreciate because here's the deal they're home yeah they're home 
you know? You have a captive audience. I mean, they are home. Uh, you know, it's, it's and they're answering their phone. So don't do it in an email. I mean, you can oh, follow no. up with, any, with a newsletter about what's happening in the market, but you need to call people and check in. Yeah, with you them. Just, not, just, not just a text either. This is a time for a real phone call. Or yeah. let's do a Zoom. Let's get together or, or schedule a little uh, client happy hour. Or a, let's just get together and, I'll, and we'll all check in if, if it's people that you hang out with, right? This is what we're doing. How, how many of those kind of things have you been on since this has all started? Have you been into any kind of – I know you've been hosting things, but have you joined any other well, people I want did, to get I together? Did. I did join one of your, uh, co you know, uh, cocktail yeah. parties or uh, happy hours. Uh, I've with some friends we've done that. I I'm going to launch one too. I, I do want to have a uh, a yeah. cocktail party. But yeah, I mean that's uh, I think that's what uh, people ought to be doing. Uh, there's a lot of lonely people, depressed, and nobody mm -hmm. to reach out to, and uh, you know you stay that's home. Uh, you know uh, it's kind of uh, kind of rough. I, I'm. I, I'm, I'm fortunate. I, you know, I like where we live. I like, you know, I'm a homebody anyways. Marilyn right. and I spend a lot of time at home. So uh, I haven't turned into Jack Torrance uh, from The Shining, you know, <laughs> uh, yet, uh, yet uh, played by Jack Nicholson. You know, the other uh, the other uh, thing about our uh, where our uh, previous course has applicability besides that five stages of grief of uh, Elizabeth Kubler Ross, but also the idea about he or she who embraces change, mm -hmm. has a competitive advantage over uh, their competition. So, totally. uh, you know, you know, if you're afraid of change, uh, you need to overcome that. Uh, the sooner you embrace it, like for example, look, uh, this Zoom thing or Facebook, this audio. You know, this is this is new to me. Uh, I I had to uh, embrace it. I'm not afraid of it. Uh, I, I I I almost wallow in the unknown and uncertainty. I kind of I kind of like it. And uh, you know, I've, I've had I've got partners like yourself and others who've helped me. So if, you know, if you reach out for help, there there you go to uh, to do it. Uh, well, let's talk a little bit about that. So because I do recall that you saw it coming, and this is something I love about you, Steve. That even when I think about how you were forward thinking, not only on the whole short sale piece, because frankly, I ended up leaving one of the companies I was at because of that short sale crisis and realizing there was such a need for training that and you were so far ahead of it that we joined forces. Um, the other thing that comes to mind before we talk about how you switch to live streaming is seeing the value of the Golden Knights in Vegas. I'm never going to get over sitting in a coffee no. shop with you and you no. saying, oh, you're wearing it. That's what made me think I of it. I'm wearing my, uh, yeah, I'm, yep. I'm, I'm and wearing my. Like, yeah. I really think, let me tell you the reasons why you need to get involved with me this. And I was stupidly did not get involved with him, but he still helped me out. And I was able to get in on some of the early, he was an early, you know, uh, what do you call it? A, uh, um, Season ticket holder, season early ticket adopter, holder, whatever. Early, early adopter before anybody even knew how good the nights were going to be, and you saw it, and and we've had fun with that. And here well, we I are in this thing. But go yeah. ahead. Well, I trusted my uh, instincts about there that. You, you see, um, you know, and I'm always telling uh, Marilyn, my wife. I'm always telling her uh, she's very bright. Although I must question her taste in men, of course. Uh, <laughs> But uh, in any event, uh, I'm always telling her, you know, when she's got an idea, uh, trust your instincts. You know, uh, by the way, I don't How believe. What's she doing, by the way? She's a she's nurse. Going, she's working at the, the hospital. And um, uh, she's, how's she handling it? Is she doing well, it's very or? stressful. It, it, look, it, even aside from the COVID scenario, uh, it's very stressful work. OK, mm -hmm. I mean, nurses uh, run the hospital. They're overworked, most of them. Uh, mo uh, not going to mention any hospitals or, or uh, health organizations, but many of them are profit motive, and uh, they you know they just look at the bottom line, and they're mm -hmm. they're churning and burning, and uh, it's a tough uh, it's a tough job. They're 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 heroes, uh, you know, and I know Absolutely. it kind of sounds cliche, but it happens to be uh, true. So she's working very hard. And mm -hmm. it is problematic. She she doesn't work in the area, direct area, uh, okay. but uh, you know it's all it could be all over the place. And uh, exactly. Well, you uh, let her know. We're thinking of her, and we do appreciate her and all of her other you know uh, medical professionals because they are the true heroes. It's crazy. It's the, the, some of the conditions in some parts of the country. Let's 
hope that that doesn't happen here for us. You know. Yeah, if you wanted to get back to the Golden Knights at all, the whole point was see, I look, I, I, this is a major league town, and and we mm -hmm. have a big enough population, and they all saw that uh, to be able to draw from. But what uh, the people who decided to do it, and what some of us believed in, was that not only. Uh, could our population base support a major league team, you know, 2 million plus, you know, mm -hmm. uh, but also being a, a international uh, destination point. So people mm -hmm. would uh, come here uh, and uh, schedule their vacations and conferences or whatever they're doing. Hey, hey, uh, you know, the Penguins are going to be in town. Let's uh, let's go. So and the other thing I had, I was up in Sacramento for 15 years. Mm -hmm. And when the Sacramento Kings, the basketball team came to uh, it, just took over the city. Now, of course, this is we're in the entertainment capital of the world. Sure. Sacramento, the the entertainment capital of Sacramento was the was the state assembly. Uh, you know, <laughs> particularly when Willie Brown was there, you know, really great guy. So I, I knew it would be uh, big, I, but I didn't know. Yeah, anything. I, I didn't know. But, yeah, I did. Yeah. So I kind of figured the same kind of a thing, but I, I'm a sports person. Yeah. I've followed sports, you are. but I didn't know anything about hockey. I took me half the season or season and a half to figure out what offsides was and icing and yep. you know check poke I, what do i know but i was we learning. all became we all became experts at uh, the blue line and what's offsides yeah. and all that. but uh yeah. I, I don't mind not knowing things and it ties into what's going on now in real estate and everything i'm not afraid of change you know i got my as you know i got my degree uh, undergraduate degree in philosophy mm -hmm. and one of the philosophers that we actually incorporated yeah. into our uh, uh, CFAC was uh, Heraclitus and a pre-Socratic philosopher and one of the things that uh, he had stated and most known for, him, uh, for is uh, that the only constant is change. Right. So you know, you'd be running counter, if you embrace that, you're running counter to nature and in the way of things to uh, to be resistant to it. It's just a fact uh, of, of life. Like, you know, what, Benjamin Franklin, the only certainty is death and taxes? Well, the only certainty is change. It's change. So I accept it. Uh, well, and let's, let's talk about how you did adapt and, and kind of finish our, our talk today on what you did and what you're doing now. And I want to get your impact as far as how you're doing your CEs here. Plus, I think you, I don't know if you have the ability to do it in other states because we have listeners from other states, but definitely and if you're a Nevada licensee, you can take advantage of Steve's CE live streams right now. And I also want you to get to talk about what you think is going to happen, if it will continue or we'll go back to have to do it live. So first of all, what did you do and how, do, how can people get to get into your live streams right now for CE if they need continuing ed? All right. So with respect to uh, Nevada uh, real estate continuing education, they just go to my website, NevadaCE.com, mm -hmm. NevadaCE.com. And I have um, on, see, I'm, I'm making a distinction. Uh, people call online classes, live stream uh, video conferencing uh, is not, it's not online. Online courses is, is a form of distance learning. So in other words, online courses, which I have, and I have a package uh, through my affiliate with online ed, and um, it's just you and the computer and you go at right. your own pace and you take quizzes. Everybody passes, so don't freak out. Mm -hmm. And then you take a test and everybody passes, okay, mm -hmm. eventually, because mm -hmm. you can just keep taking it. So that's mm -hmm. online is distance. Now, what I'm doing now is live stream video conferencing. You want to call it webinar? Yeah, it's what we're doing right now. Digital uh, On uh, March 27th, the real estate division uh, decided that live stream like this, digital technology would be considered a form of live instruction because in in Nevada, uh, if so, let's say uh, a subsequent renewal is usually 24 hours with certain mandated topics. Uh, years ago, you could take it all online, you know, distance, correspondence, whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, they decided no, we want people to go at least half live, so it's half and half. So as long as I can see you, you can see me. 
and you're in the classroom, although we take breaks and you're still allowed to be absent a little bit, percentage, uh, this is considered live instruction. And, uh, uh, you know, it's going well, we'll be doing a class together later today, uh, you and I, I'm looking forward to that. Uh, wh whether or not it'll continue or not, uh, mm -hmm. uh, I don't, you know, I think it's gonna be tough uh, to go back. You know, once you open up the door, now, some people think that this was just a temporary measure. There's nothing in the uh, statement that the division made. If you go to the red.nv.gov and look at their March 27th uh, uh, statement, uh, it, is, it is temporary in the context of the governor's uh, uh, directive. directive. Uh, however, it doesn't, uh, there's no mention with, from the real estate division that what we're doing is temporary. It's just mm -hmm. happening in conjunction with that. And as much as I love being in, uh, in a live classroom, um, I'm hoping that this does remain. Uh, this is the present, this is the future. Mm -hmm. And there'll, there'll, there'll still be people who will want to be in a live classroom. And so if this does change. You'll do both maybe? Well, occasionally. What I'll do is I'll do uh, a, a live classes and live streaming live simultaneously. Mm -hmm. In other words, those in the classroom are in the live studio audience and you're right. at home or wherever you are. That's actually cool. And you know what, so do you think also that if that's the case, the real estate division would have to work because it it is they would have to work with the legislature to change, to modify the code, to, to amend the code. To, do you feel like that's required to define what live means? Because that's really what we're talking about. Well, definition of live, right? Yeah. Well, you know, there's uh, interesting. I was kind of talking uh, to the uh, deputy uh, administrator Perry Fagan before mm -hmm. this uh, came uh, down, and uh, you know, look, they ch they changed it without an emergency regulation. That's true. They they uh, otherwise see because I asked him about that. I said, look, it can't we have an um, an emergency regulation, but of course they're too busy. They're yeah. doing a lot of other things that takes time. Uh, you could do it by regulatory change. Uh, I, I'm uncertain. I'd have to research it myself to see whether the administrator um, under some vague language in the uh, statute or regulation has the authority to do things that some people would argue uh, circumvent regulation or statute, yeah. but yeah, you know, the way I feel is that uh, this uh, this COVID virus scenario is going to go on for a while. I think it gives them time if they want to go that route. Good point. Uh, they could certainly uh, get a, a workshop going for regulation and then redefine it. But uh, right. there's no exactly. going back. I think you're right. It's going to be exciting, and I like it. I'm embracing it. You know me. I embrace change. So do you. We, we put that as the very beginning of our course and we will do it again if we have to, not if, when we have to bring a modified version of that out, it's going to be he, who, he or she who adapts first and easily uh, thrives. And it's the truth. Uh, if, you're, if you wait and you stay on the sidelines, frankly, I feel like there's gonna be a people that are, if this goes on and it will for a while, then it's going to impact our market, it already is. It's going to drive people out of the real estate business, which then is good for the people who stay. There's less competition. Uh, I see. I, I project that that's going to happen, Steve. That it's not going to be as bad as it was in the, the last go around, in my opinion. However, comma, it, if it goes on with 50%, because right now for the last three or four weeks, we are experiencing 50% less under contracts. Steady listings, consistent new listings, but less buyers, which of course is going to set up things. If it continues, it'll set up a, a dynamic of, of maybe there's a whole bunch of people waiting on the sidelines, but see, this is the point. Nobody knows, you know, when you're in the middle of it, right? So you just have to be ready for anything. Exactly. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it, real estate in the long term is always a very good investment. We don't know, uh, there are people, but you know, when investors, uh, uh, when, when they leave the market, uh, they're not willing to take the risk uh, either. Mm -hmm. So uh, they'll be back, though. They so, will oh be yeah, back. everybody they're will waiting. be back, and you can mm -hmm. never, whether it's the uh, stock market or uh, treasury bill, you know, uh, whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, real estate, you never know when a bottom is, but uh, real estate until you're through it. 
until yeah. you're on the other side of it, right? Real estate is, uh, to me is not as big as a risk as the volatility of a stock market. Uh, 100% agree. And I think there's a lot of people thinking about maybe they should diversify. So lots of reasons. Okay, so if you need to get updated into your CE classes and get ahead of that and experience the CE from the beauty and comfort of your own home, you got to go to nevadace.com. We're going to put in the show notes, episode 116 over at WBNL Podcast, all of Steve's info. Uh, he's got great content on his website. He's putting up blog posts. Uh, his And you can get into all of his classes and they're selling out. So you want to be able to get ahead and get in there. And honestly, I'm, I'm looking forward to doing some classes with you, Steve. And and we'll I, I believe you, we're going to continue on. So any last thoughts? Thank you for yeah, being I, here today. I, if I might... Uh make one more plug for myself, if you will. Um, I want people to know when they go to my site, they can see that I also do, oh, yeah. I started to do expert witness work uh, in lawsuits. So uh, if they or their broker or their attorneys need somebody, uh, uh, they could consider uh, calling me. I, I've worked on the defense side. I've worked on the plaintiff side uh, either way. But I particularly like the plaintiff side when real estate brokers or agents and others have scammed the public. So uh, either way, you know, if I believe in the case, I'm happy to work on it. Strong endorsement from me on that for sure. Steve is great at that. In fact, I call Steve when I have questions and he has helped a ton of agents and brokers with that very, very uh, skill set. And so, yeah, definitely go to Nevada CE to see all the things that he does to help you and come join a class soon and uh, have have some entertainment while you also get the necessary education for your renewal of your C of your uh, real estate license. Definitely. Thanks for having me. All yeah. right, have a, have a great day and see you soon, Steve. See you in Take a Zoom care. soon. Bye-bye. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye. Come take my hand and see the world around you. The time is right, just let the light surround you. And step by step, you feel it coming alive. The feeling deep down inside. The best memories are made when you take the road less traveled. Visit wanderingbutnotlost.com for some inspiration. Today on Wandering Zen, we are back at National Park Week 2020. We're going to call this Pondering Zen today because we're not really getting out and, and wandering or, or looking at things. We're going to talk about the national parks and we're going to just go through some fun facts about what's going on, not what's going on, but what about the National Park Service in general. So let's just jump in. Let's get through these 20 and uh, then we can get on with going back and watching some of the awesome live streams that have been happening from the National Park Service from the different parks. I'm telling you, I have seen so many great live streams this week it's been fantastic not to mention i forget uh we heart national parks i think was a new facebook page that the national oh, Park hi. Foundation hi put there. Together. Yeah, hello sheldon um put put up and it's been great to see people just post all their pictures it's been really really cool that parks or pics and recs uh uh site they have up beautiful images in there i've submitted three uh articles to that right. that have been posted which have been really cool a couple pictures it's just it's just good to see everyone's just the love that people have for the national parks is really cool so anyway so let's get started now jan this first one i know that you're going to know the answer to this although okay. i didn't put you on the spot because that's very nerve-wracking to put someone on the spot like that so i already I'll be, I'll be i apologize best. in advance but what was the very first national park i think it's yosemite it's yellowstone actually you i mean no no i meant yellowstone yeah, yeah, I meant yeah. Yellowstone. that's right the other yellowstone. Why. The other yeah why. exactly I, yellowstone I founded yeah. in 1872. now the majority of Yellowstone sits in Wyoming, but there's also a little sliver of it that's in Idaho and Montana. So they can both claim that the park is in their state as well. Uh -huh. Okay. I, as you know, Jan O'Brien, I am a big advocate of the park visitor center. The visitor center to me is a place that we go in, no matter what park we go into for a couple of reasons, one to get information and two, which I know you'll appreciate Jan O'Brien. You can get your passport, passport stamped. Exactly. So uh, visitor center is a, a, a must do. Uh, no matter where you are, how many times you go? I mean, we've been to Yosemite a million times, but we go to the visitor center there all the time. So uh, go to the visitor center. Any guess on how many visitor centers there are in the National Park uh, System? Just uh, Isn't there one for every park? No, there's multiple in every park. So this is a high number. Uh, this one, this so number is high. 200? I, I, higher, Bob. Uh, 300? 
880. No way. Yeah. How, many par- how, many, how many parks are there? You know what? That's one of those things that's hard to... Exactly. I think, if I'm not mistaken, there's 50-something, like 56 or something actual national parks, but then there's so many national monuments, seashores, yeah. protected yeah. areas, all of that stuff. So, um, uh, so you just stumped the panel on that one. So uh, nearly 880 or right around 880 visitor centers. I, I love that stat and I want to go to every single one of them because I think they're awesome. I love talking to rangers. It's so cool. Yeah. Cause I love, they have a passion for their job and it's a neat thing. Mm-hmm. Okay. Did you know, Jana Bryan, did you know the national park uh, parks contain at least 247 species of threatened or endangered plants and animals, more than 75,000 archeological sites and nearly 27,000 historic and prehistoric structures. No. So they are, uh, there's there's more than just getting out and taking a scenic drive. They are preserving our heritage and our history and our planet, really, our animals and and uh, uh, and botany as well. So pretty cool. The Great Smoky Mountains National Park is the most visited national park in the United States, with over nine million guests per year. Followed by wow. the Grand yeah, followed by the Grand Canyon, which is number two on the list, which is like over four million uh, or so guests a, a year. So let's, take, let's talk about Great Smoky. You know why? I think it's because it's easily accessible and there are think, so many, um, it goes through so many states, doesn't it? Yeah. Or is it's it Tennessee it's, and, and it's beautiful. It's it's like easy to get to and there's it's on the East Coast. There's tons of people there where you have to really drive to get to Sequoia and Yosemite sure, exactly. and some of them, right? I think that's exactly why for that. And also because it is around such a huge population base mm-hmm. and you can get there and do so many different recreational activities in the Smoky Mountains. You know, there's there really there's there's everything you can think of as far as outdoorsmanship goes there. Mm-hmm. Um, and they have beautiful, I mean, it's beautiful all year round as well. So it's, you know, it's open all year round and it's easy to access and the weather's good. So yeah, absolutely. And I've never been, I mean, I've driven through parts, but I've never really technically gone there to be in the park. I've never been to visitor center there. So um, uh, Smoky Mountains are absolutely on my uh, list. So the largest park in the lower, you know, 48 in the contiguous, uh, contiguous United States, uh, you know, the 48 is Death Valley National Park, stretching 5,300 square miles or 3.4 million acres is Death Valley. Uh, and in, quite beautiful, actually. People don't uh, think it's, it's uniquely beautiful. I did. You drove through there one time. I did. You? And yeah. I stopped and checked out some of the places that you told me to go look at. It, <laughs> I, I have to agree. It is absolutely beautiful. And if you go in the spring or early summer, the wildflowers there are amazing. And it's not mm-hmm. like driving and eat. You can see it a little bit from your car, but you have to actually get out of your car and go look because it's the there's the most fragile, beautiful little tiny wildflowers. I've got a couple pictures over in the on the website at w or wanderingbutnotlost.com. You should go check them out. They're it's really amazing. Now, the smallest national park actually is Hot Springs National Park in Arkansas. Hmm. Um it You've comes, been there, haven't you? I have been there. It's been it's actually about five thousand five hundred acres in total, and it's a neat little area. Um, it, it was actually the first federally protected protected piece of land in the United States back in eighteen uh, thirty two, but it wasn't named a national park until nineteen twenty one. It it is known for its beauty of the surrounding mountains and everything. There's some hiking trails there, but what it really is known for back in the day. They had a bunch of bathhouses there, and the people from the north would come down to get cured, you know, of their ailments. They'd go down and they would soak and they would steam in the uh, in the hot springs. It's really amazing. Um, a few of those bathhouses are still, well, for the longest time, a lot of them were there, but none of them were open. They were in disrepair, but they've gone in the last 20 years or so, and they've actually updated and modernized a few of them and actually reopened them back up. I actually yeah. went in one day and did the whole bathhouse experience, and it wow. was it was really it was neat to be in there because the the building was just the architecture and the style of all of the fixtures and everything was really cool. Uh, that is a weird experience. <laughs> People drying you off, not my deal. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I wouldn't do it again. Uh, but it was an right. but it was an interesting thing, and it was neat to do that because you kind of really took you back to a different time because it's certainly not like that anymore. Okay, Mount McKinley, Kinley in Alaska. Uh, in Denali National Park is the highest point in any of the national parks. Um, I had forgotten how tall Mount McKinley was. It's 20,302 feet tall. That is high. 
<laughs> Mount Whitney here in uh, California, which is the large, tallest mountain in the 48, right. is 14444 or something like that. So it's 6,000 feet uh, shorter, which is amazing if you're a hiker. That is a huge elevation gain right there. Crazy. You guys haven't been to Alaska, have you? No, I've never is that, been is there. That, is that on your list? Of it is. Well, the ever? pictures that you took when you were up there, they're amazing. amazing. Well, I, I would want to go back because we never got off the cruise ship, but to, to go to Denali or to, to to check out the interior of Alaska. Would be yeah, awesome. oh, I know because it just looks so beautiful. Because you think of it all just being as this one big huge snow sheet. It's not. No. It's, it's beautiful, lush, you know, the tundra. Hi, it's amazing. So, um, so Mount McKinley highest place uh, in the national parks and there's two national parks located north of the arctic circle so this would be a kick to go to sometime uh the arctic national park and the kobuk uh, valley national park they're both obviously in alaska and uh and very high up there but it would be neat to to go and see those national parks i don't have any really i've never done much research on that so i need to go out and do that before national park week is over while i'm on this national park kick and go check those those out as well now one of the hottest temperatures on earth and I guess you know where this is going to go back to was recorded in 1913 in Death Valley National Park, mm -hmm. registering 134 degrees. Whoa! Yeah, and Death Valley also it's like does everything. It's got the most land. It's the hottest. It also boasts the lowest point in the Western Hemisphere, Badwater Basin. It's 282 feet below sea level. Practically so, to the center of the Earth. Uh, exactly. Thank you very much. Did you go by Badwater when you went through there? Do you remember? Mm -hmm. Mm -mm, I don't think so. Yeah, I think it's the. I can't remember the names of the cool places right now. Off the top it's kind of it's kind of cool because there's a little boardwalk that walks out kind of over the salt flats there, and it, it, it is just really Maybe. a different area than when you get a little bit farther north and there's sand dunes and everything up there. So it's uh, it's the Death Valley is very diverse and it's you know the way it's laid out as well. Sure. Okay, one of my favorite states for national parks, Utah. It has five national parks, and they're all within, within driving distance of each other. Now, I wouldn't really be much of a day trip because you wouldn't see much, but I, I guess you could randomly do that if you wanted to all in a day. Only if you wanted to stamp your passport and say you've been there. <laughs> right, but if you want to go hit a bunch of parks at the same time, Utah is the place to go because they're all pretty totally. close together there. Um, so uh, uh, they're all right there. Sequoia National Park's namesake trees are some of the world's largest living things on Earth which I know Jan O'Brien loves the the sequoia. Yeah, it's, I think it's really right there with Yosemite for me so far. I, I, it may even be my number one. Yeah, it's, of the trees. I, I agree, because it's I, I battle that myself if I have to really mm -hmm. choose. And the Redwoods National Park in California along the coast have some of the tallest trees. So mm -hmm. there are, it's tree mania in Northern California. Mm -hmm. uh, Everglades National Park protects more than 25% of Florida's original Everglades, which is a... I think a pretty amazing number considering that it didn't really um, get going for a lot. They had a hard time getting that park actually on the map because there was so much uh, going on down in Florida as there always is. Uh, hashtag and, Florida. <laughs> hashtag heart Florida. Um, uh, but thankfully they've been able to do that because a lot of the wetlands have been able to kind of been reclaimed because of the Everglades National Park you know, coming into to play. Now this is one of my favorite little uh, parts because I love caves so much. There's an awesome cave in Sequoia National Park called Crystal Cave. It's a small little thing, but it's just so cool. Off the beaten track and a lot of people, I mean, they have tours that fill up and sometimes they sell out, but it's not something people go to Sequoia for, but it's a cool thing. But Mammoth Cave National Park in Kentucky has the longest cave system in the world with more than 3,454 mapped miles of subterranean cave um hikes well, that you can't all go on but they're all underneath here carlsbad national caverns <clears throat> in new mexico is home to the nation's deepest cave which is 1593 feet deep and wind cave in south dakota is the first cave to be named a national park in the world and that is a really super cool cave i've been there there's actually it's right outside of keystone um South Dakota, and there's Wind Cave, and oh my gosh, now I'm forgetting the name of the other one. Chris, no, not Crystal Cave. Anyway, there's two caves that are that are on either side of the city, so there's two national parks there that are caves right in in South Dakota. Pretty cool if you're a cave. Question? Yes. Are you the Batman? I think I might be. The Batman. The Batman. <laughs> At 1,932 feet deep, Crater Lake National Park in Oregon is the deepest lake in the United States. 
And all it is, it's sunk sitting down in the in the bowl of this caldera. If you've never been to Crater Lake, if you've seen pictures, it just looks like this beautiful seen mountain it. in a way. If you have been there and you really realize what the heck it is, it is weird to think of that you're sitting on the top of this this volcano and all of this water is inside the middle of that. There's a little island, which is actually a little, and the reason why the island was actually created because it's a caldera within a caldera. So there is a, anyway, it's weird when you really sit down and think of it, but the water is so blue. If you ever get a chance to go to Crater Lake, please, you've got to do that. Speaking of calderas, Yellowstone caldera, which is funny, when I was growing up, they didn't really call Yellowstone a volcano. <laughs> but now it's like the super volcano, right? Uh, it's uh, uh, responsible for three of the world's largest volcano eruptions. Huh, hmm. I didn't know that. Hmm. That was hmm. kind of interesting. Three of the 10 highest waterfalls in the world are located in Yosemite National Park. Mm -hmm. And one of them, Ribbon Falls uh, in Yosemite, just get kind of get a reference of kind of how tall these are, is nine times taller than Niagara Falls. Wow. And how tall Niagara Falls is, and you multiply that nine times, it's a pretty incredible thing, because Niagara Falls is not like a little tiny waterfall either, you know? So uh, it gives you a sense of how tall that is if you've never been there. Uh, back on the volcano, the Mauna Loa Volcano in Hawaii, uh, Volcanoes National Park is the largest volcano on the earth wow. in terms of volume and height uh, above its base. It contains about 19,000 cubic miles of lava. That's really comforting. Mm -hmm. And rises more than 50,000 feet above its base. So just think about that for a minute. If, um, let's see, uh, uh, Mount McKinley is 20,000 feet tall. You add 30,000 feet below that. That's how tall Mauna Loa is in height because 30,000 of it is below the, well, it's not 20,000 feet. But if we looked at Mount McKinley, 30,000 of it would be below the, the water line. Wow. So think about it. It's a huge, gigantic thing. Mesa Verde National Park was the first national park to be recognized for works of man and acknowledgement of incredible cliff dwellings that they have there left beyond by the Pueblo Indians. So um, before that, prior to that, it was all just nature and scenic beauty and historic value that brought the park on. Hmm. Okay. There are 25 active glaciers and more than 700 lakes of various sizes in Glacier National Park. This is the park that I think more than any of them, if you are if you are a national park lover and you want you have things on your bucket list, get to Glacier as fast as you can. <laughs> because they predict that within the next 20 years, most of those glaciers will no longer be there anymore because of global warming and, and mm -hmm. you want to see glacier with glaciers you need to get it on your bucket list and you need to get there and see it we were there probably oh gosh it's probably been five years ago now maybe a little bit more and uh went on a ranger led tour out to grinnell glacier it is uh, unbelievable the 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 color of the ice and the the like melt blue. Yeah, just i can't even describe the color it's this light it's like that light blue, yeah, of, right? almost it is iridescent. Almost it's iridescent really, is the word I was looking for. Really, really interesting. And the 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 pool of water down below uh, is just beautiful, almost like a gray blue that you know if you put your finger in it, well, your finger would stick. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. so cool. But what's really cool about that glacier is to when you're walking when you're walking up, you're looking at all the landscape around you. When you're walking back and you've seen it and you've been right there by it and you see some of the rocks that are around the glacier as it's pulling back and you're walking back down, you have a whole different appreciation for the landscape because you know that that glacier was down there. Right, mm -hmm. and, the, and it has pulled and created all of the the rubble and the the topography of the land that you're walking down now is really an interesting experience because before you were walking on it too, but it didn't feel the same until you got there and saw the magnitude and the might of what those glaciers can really do. So I think it's incredible. Uh, Voyagers National Park in Minnesota has 344 square miles of, uh, of nav navigable waters for boating, canoeing, and kayak kayaking. Minnesota is a place that I really want to go spend some time. All of that whole area up there because the water and the lakes and the trees. I was talking to our friend a couple of podcasts ago um, who lives in Minnesota and saying that I've always wanted to go back to New England for the fall, which would be awesome. I still want to do that, obviously because it's just, you know, classic stuff. But the fall in Minnesota and Michigan and Wisconsin, all around that area is really spectacular as well. I've seen, one of my favorite shows is Aerial America on Smithsonian and they have done shots of that. And it's, it is 
every bit as beautiful as, in my opinion, anyway, of as um, New Hampshire or uh, New England without all the people. So <laughs> that's that's a place to go. And our our last little tip today today is just a nod to the National Park Service itself. Self, you know, they protect over eighty four million acres of wild landscapes and historic sites in the United States. With over, get this, and it will be fun to hike every mile of this eighteen thousand miles of trails in the national park waiting for mm. you to get out and wander and be forever wandering but not lost so there is that. so much to do with that i have a question what's yeah. the youngest what's the newest park well you know is the the last national park that i know that is an actual national park status happened in 1993 i think or maybe it was 2003 uh it's pinnacles national park here in california um, it's up south of the Bay Area, kind of uh, uh, inland from, I would say, uh, no, south of Santa Cruz, kind of in that Monterey, Santa Cruz kind of area, inland a little bit. Haven't been there yet. Love to go. That made California have nine officially official national parks, which now makes it the state with the most national parks, nine national parks in California. Oh, my God. I thought I was going to stump you, but of course not. So there you go. <laughs> but Pinnacle's <laughs> pretty, pretty cool. I, 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 It's another one of those places. I guess, you know, obviously national parks are always, not always, but a lot often off the beaten track because that's where the new of course <laughs> everything that's not on the beaten track has already been developed so Correct. yeah so you have to make an effort to go there and, and i i have, was having a hard time when we were planning a trip there one time when it first opened because we wanted to go where to stay because you can't stay like right there you have to kind of stay somewhere and then drive over so uh certainly. i have one other question is do you think in the united states there are areas that ought to be a national park is there yeah. anything left that that has ever come up in the you know, like, cause it's a big deal to, to save the land and to get it, you know, it has to be an act of Congress or the president or something, right? So, yeah, well, so either, name it. either or. The president can actually declare national monuments. So that's kind of mm -hmm. how that whole thing started. So yeah. uh, the actual national parks have to be declared by the Congress. That, but you know what happens all the time? Every presidency, if you go back and do some research, every presidency wants to, are, well, are, yeah, they want a legacy and they had, want their name on them. And as a matter of fact, I believe- what uh, Was it Roosevelt Yellowstone? Did it really start with Teddy, Teddy yeah, Roosevelt? Teddy, Teddy's the one that really got a lot of the, the, the stuff going, but it was yeah. even before that actually is when they really started, but he was, he was bully on the park. Magic, so yeah. 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 And uh, I, I'll know, you know, Obama did a lot of uh, uh, seashore, seashores too. Um, I know Bill Clinton was um, responsible for really expanding the boundaries of Sequoia National Park. As a matter of fact, I don't believe, because it's uh, actually, they didn't expand the boundaries of the park, but created the, a national recreation area between Sequoia and Kings Canyon. So that whole area there on the Kings Highway now is technically all protected land where before, you know, in the before the 90s, that whole area there was just open public land. So, and I believe that, I forget what the Trump administration sometime this year actually did declare something a national, um, protected some land somewhere. So yeah, it's, uh, it's on the, I, I actually, off the top of my head, I, I just think they just need to make sure that they are protecting the lands they, that we are. We already uh, have. Because there are some. Encroaching on it. Yeah, I know. Yeah, there are some that have been encroached on over the past, mm -hmm. you know, past few years that uh, we need to really, you know, to watch that and be good stewards of the earth because it not only is a great place to go and wander, but it really does help create and collect uh, and showcase our, our environment. And it's so uh, wonderful for the animals to have a place where they can roam, you know. Absolutely. Them. Which I believe they're probably enjoying it without all the people in their parks right now. I, I bet. Have you seen anything about that? Or are you, like, are, are all the, the wildlife just like going, this is awesome. Like we don't have people here or maybe they're missing us because you know, the people food still people feed feed them, unfortunately. No, no, but I think they have. I've seen a few things from Yosemite where people, you know, are people. The animals are just walking around doing their thing. You see a lot more of a mountain. A ranger had said, and I think I might have mentioned this last week or and one other time we were talking about this. That the ranger is saying, you know, it's not like there's more animals because all these animals were just right off. They're of the just bridges, visible. Yeah, but they're they're down and now. Um, Sweepy was saying yesterday that she was reading an article about someplace I believe it was in Africa or I don't know, it was some place where there isn't as much, you know, human activity anymore. And there were just lions laying around in this. I street. saw that. They're yeah. out on the road. Isn't that amazing? Prides of lions hanging what's out. It's going to be yeah. interesting. And I was, I was, you know, uh, lamenting this fact 
yesterday uh, when the parks open back up again and people are all back in and racing around, there's going to be a lot of animals I'm sure that are going to be hit. So mm -hmm. I would say I was doing my uh, personal plea to the national parks to put up barriers heck all over the place to make people drive slow because mm -hmm. otherwise they're not going to. And animals who now are used to being out walking around are- And they have to get retrained that, oh yeah, here come all these people again. And they will. I mean, really you know, that's the way it works, but, right. but it's interesting. So. Well, great facts. Uh, I learned some things. I'll put it in my trivia for my next Trivial Pursuit. I've learned some things about the parks yet again. Thank you, sir. Remember that game that we bought that you and Laura and I were playing when we were going up there? With <laughs> and the questions were so hard, we gave up. <laughs> That is really only for the true, true, true park lovers of oh, the world. Right. And we're like, well, maybe we could, maybe this is a living experience. Yeah, for about five cards until we, we suck so bad. Done with that. <laughs> All <laughs> Done. Right. All right, everyone. Enjoy the rest of National Park Week. But you know, National Parks are, are more important and more uh, worth celebrating than just one week a year. So make sure that you are a National Park fan. If you don't have one, buy a National Park Pass. They support the parks. Yes. And you can, and you can make that money back really, really quickly, actually if you visit too many of them. So anyway, National Parks, I'm a fan. Get out there and find your park. Be forever wandering, but not lost. You're listening to the Wandering But Not Lost podcast, where real estate and reality meet. Join us and subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Google Play, and now on YouTube. Well, that's a wrap for episode 116 of the Wandering But Not Lost podcast, where real estate and reality meet. You know all of our show notes over at wbnlpodcast.com. Channel Brian, I wonder how many weeks, really, we were talking about this a little bit on the open, we're going to be talking and giving updates on what's happening in real estate in the COVID-19. Yeah, I, well, as long as it's topical, so we have to keep talking about it. Uh, all I know is um, those who adapt, adapt early. Steve talked a little bit about it. He threw a little bit of his... Uh, his scholarly, uh, he was actually a, he has a degree in philosophy. <laughs> That's what his, that was his undergraduate degree was you know, in. What does it yep. Steve you? Yeah, so, you know? but, but we talked about those who accept, accept change quickly are the ones who thrive. And we know that, and that's really one of the things there. But here's a question I have regarding your segment on the national parks. While you were talking, I was thinking, hmm, is it too late to be a park ranger? <laughs> Maybe that is something to explore as a semi-retirement type of a thing. How fun would that be? If you don't think I haven't thought about that, I'm really into it. I, well, I figured you probably know about that. Like, I, yeah. the, the rangers don't make much money. I know that they do it for the love of, of what it right. is, but I have no clue what you have to do to become a park ranger. A good friend there. of ours, a good friend of ours, their nephew was a park ranger up in Yosemite, actually, or was. I don't think he is anymore. Actually, I know he's not anymore, but he did it for years. It's a, it, it is really, you know, you are, you do have to have a total passion for for doing that and um but i think it's a little bit like the military you can get after reading the nevada bar books that your wife has turned me on to um the life of the park ranger is a little bit like okay we're going to station you here now and then you're getting assigned to this park and it's what remind, it reminded me of being in the army actually yeah and you can get shifted around too so a lot of it's seniority you know so mm -hmm. it's been, but I, you know laura and i used to always talk about how great it would be just to go up work at, UC, at the iwani yeah, I'd wait, I'd wait tables at the Iwani. Are you kidding me? Yeah, That'd be a yeah. great, uh, great job. You know. Work in the uh, the gift shop, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> All Work. right. Well, we'll see. Okay. All right, everyone, uh, stay safe out there. I know that I know some people are getting cabin fever. I'm still kind of enjoying it, so I can't really complain. I know. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm just as busy, busier than I've ever been. Right? I think I all I do is one Zoom after another, and I'm enjoying it, and we're educating and training, and business is happening, and it's uh, it's all good. You know, you just have to find ways to find your balance, that's which right. is, and I know what you do is to get up and get out, right? And and, and that's what it is for me. It's, it's important to get outside and get some of the vitamin D and get some sunshine. It's, in our side, where we are here on the West Coast, it's it's getting it's going to be ninety, maybe yeah. seven, ninety-eight degrees this weekend. How about for you? Oh yeah, it's been very warm. I walk. It was. Yeah. I don't know why I did this yesterday. It was so funny. I called my friend. I was walking. It was like three o'clock in the afternoon. <laughs> I'm like, why am I walking on in the hottest time of the day on the hottest freaking day of the year? What the heck am I doing? But it was nice to be out, and I'm going to tell you, the sun felt good. I'll, I'll tell you, speaking of getting up and getting out, which is kind of funny that since all this started, I've been really doing more exercise than I ever had before. My watch told me yesterday that I had the longest uh, move streak I've ever had, so, which is very funny wow. considering we're sheltering in place. Yes. Okay. Well, well done. You're staying balanced. All right, we'll see you next week on the WBNL podcast. Everybody, truly stay safe, but find some balance and be forever wandering. But not lost. <laughs>